All right, everybody, we're just going to, we're not quite at 3.30 yet, so we'll wait a little bit longer before we start, but we're getting ready, so um, we'll be starting soon. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're gonna start right now. This is the second webinar series we're doing. It's the second installment of that series. So, of the second series. So we're gonna uh, go ahead and talk about resistive versus reactive grounding. Um, we have, let me get this mouse thing out of the way. Here we go. So we get calls from time to time uh, regarding reactive grounding, whether or not we provide it, uh, should we use this, should we use it versus resistive grounding? We are not reactive grounding manufacturers. I'm not going to pretend that we are. We are resistive grounding manufacturers, but uh, we do know a bit about the topic and we want to discuss uh, just just to answer a lot of the questions that have been asked to us over the over the years and months. Um, so we also, I also, we also do a lot of lunch and learn presentations and that seems to come up quite a bit so we wanted to address it in a webinar why not right so let's go ahead and get started my name is chris small um, i've been a application engineer and regional sales manager at post lover for about uh, 12 years now so i graduated with my electrical engineering degree from ohio state i will i will i will confess to you right now i was i was in a lot worse mood until about a week ago when I heard that Ohio State was actually going to play football, I know a lot of us have dealt with a lot worse situations, and, and you know, with uh, with the, with with everything that's going on. But uh, the, for me, that was kind of like oh, that. You can take away that for me too. But I'm I'm in a better mood now, so hopefully, hopefully, I won't be uh, I will be reflecting that in my presentation today. So what are we reviewing today? Um, we're going to talk about some definitions, kind of define what we're what we're doing, kind of do a, I would call it like a, a review course for a lot of us. Uh, some people may not know the difference between reactance resistance grounding or, uh, you know, how how it works. So we want to kind of keep let everybody catch up on that on that regard as well. Then we're going to talk about reactance grounding, resistance grounding, and then just talk about where it's be where it's being used typically, and uh, where to go from there. So just a, just a, a note about our scope. Uh, we're typically be talking today about medium voltage, high voltage, reactive grounding, resistance grounding, but basically low reactive grounding, low resistance grounding. Um, I mean, essentially, technically, we are also talking about um, a Peterson coil. So, you know, we're kind of going, but we're sticking with the medium voltage and high voltage today. So. Um, one thing we're not talking about, but I want to mention, was low voltage. Typically speaking, your solid grounding and high resistance grounding, your low voltage industrial applications. Um, 
just in case you guys were looking forward to hearing about high resistance ground today, it's not really going to happen. So if you want more details on that, please, uh, we, we love to talk about it because we feel like it's a really great application at low and even up to 5 kV. Uh, so we have other webinars or we can set up lunch and learns for you guys if you guys are interested. But today we're going to be talking about uh, at the mean voltage and high voltage levels. So start with some definitions. Impedance, just to keep it really simple, it's, you know, well, if I'm, if I stand in front of you, I'm impeding your ability to walk, you know, or, you know, if it's, a, if it's an electrical circuit, anything that restricts the amount of flow of current is, is, imp is an impedance. So there's a, you know, there's a few different types of impedance, but that's the basic definition of impedance. The, the, the two uh, subcategories of that are resistance and reactance. The resistance is the portion of the impedance resulting in a conversion of electrical energy into heat and radiation. So um, it's really, there's a couple of different types of loads that you can have. You can have resistance load, you can have reactive load. If you have a resistance load, you're going to always, it's always going to always generate energy into heat and radiation. Um, there's, there's no ability for it to do otherwise. So we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a, a little more detail in a second. Reactance is the portion of the impedance that is due to the capacitance or inductance or both. So some people will call it the imaginary portion uh, of your of your power, um, or you can call it the reactive power. But uh, the the point is that it's due to it's due to either capacitance or inductance. So what does that what does that look like? So uh, to be a little more to be a little general about it to kind of keep it simple, an inductance is a load which consumes reactive power. So we have um, active power, we have reactive power. But inductance is a load which consumes it, and the capacitance is a load which supplies it. So we have, so one of the reasons why I want to talk about this is because it, when it comes to power, it's important to understand the relationship between these. Your overall power is called your apparent power, and so you have real power, which is P, and then your active power, which is Q. And if you take the vector sum and overall magnitude of that, it's going to be your apparent power. That's your overall power uh, consumption. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna have both a, a real and a and a reactive element to that. The reason why that matters um, is that you have when I say real power, um, we're talking about. And we don't need to get into all these different uh, terminologies like power factor and everything, but basically, you are always going to be have positive power, and you're always going to be. Uh, giving off energy. So what happens here is, so power is literally just a, a multiplication between voltage and current. And with resistive power, you're always going to have uh, the phases, that the voltage and current sync. So what, my point is, is that if you, not to get too weedy here, but if you get two positive signals, you multiply those together, you're going to get a positive value. If you get two negative signals, you're going to multiply those two, you're going to get a positive value. So the power is always going to be positive, and so you're always outputting power, and so therefore uh, you're always burning energy. So the the difference between I won't go through all these, but the difference between that and a reactive load is you have either a leading or lagging signal, um, and so what happens is you don't always have a positive or uh, you don't always have a, a positive power. So essentially, what that means is you have positive and negative, which means you're taking and you're giving power to the to the system. So reactive loads actually kind of, is kind of give and take. They kind of oscillate between uh, giving and taking power uh, based off of the the uh, the circuit, the type of circuit you have. One thing one thing I did I didn't mention actually. Let me, uh, let me go back to this slide real quick. Um, I wanted to mention this is because we're going to talk about systems capacitance. And a capacitor is literally a two conductors with an insulator in between. A lot of times when we talk about systems capacitance, we're referring to the phase to ground reference of that. But essentially, you could have a conductor, parallel cables, or you could have a cable tray, a conductor, and, and some air in between or some cable insulation. And that actually is defined as a capacitance. So go back to here. So when you're talking about your systems capacitance, it's all those things. It's all those things added up. So basically, you have 
what could be a, a capacitance in your system for line the ground? You could have, like I mentioned before, those cables, motor windings, all kinds of different things in your system that contribute a very small level of capacitance line the ground. And th so therefore you have what, what you can see here as your system's capacitance, um, which is represented by these three uh, capacitor uh, capacitors right here. So um, when you get a ground fault like shown here, you're essentially going to be the current is going to be flowing through these two non-faulted phases on the with capacitance. So the, you have the ability to store current here. You also have the ability to to um, to have a, have a, a voltage here. Um, what happens is a lot of times one thing we have to worry about when we talk about impedance grounding is you can have an overvolted system. So like for example, an ungrounded system, uh, if you have a intermittent fault of any kind, it could be an arc fault, it could be a different type of fault, but if you have an intermittent fault, which essentially all that means is on and off, on and off, that kind of acts like a switch. Whenever that switch closes, you're building charge. In an ungrounded system as shown here, you don't really have anywhere to discharge this. So it actually builds up voltages. IEEE mentions how you can get up to 68 times your rate of voltage and over voltage your system. Well, the same can be true in an impedance ground system if it is not properly sized. Um, so that's a consideration we need to look at um, and something we'll talk about more, but I just wanted to define that for you guys because uh, that's um, in the solid ground system is not a, a big deal. Um, you don't actually over voltage, you actually over current, but it, in the other types of systems it's possible, especially if you're not, uh, if you're not, uh, the sizing your resistor reactor correctly, then you could that could happen. So just quick review. Obviously, you have your impedance, uh, it's your overall resistance, or I should say, your your the ability to with, to lower the amount of current that's flowing in the system. Then you have two different branches of that. You have your resistance and your reactance. We talked about real real loads, real power, and reactive loads, reactive power. Um, and the two different types of capacitance inductance, two different types of reactance uh, loads where, where you have uh, a storing or a giving of power and then a, a basically a usage of, power, of reactive power. So that's kind of how it's broken down. So we're going to stop real quick here for a poll question um, just to see what you guys think. We'll, we'll take about 20 to 30 seconds before to get everybody to answer. And uh, we will conclude after that, or resume, excuse me, after that. All right, so it looks like everybody took that. We got that going, so let's keep going here. So we're gonna start off with different types of reactive grounding. We're gonna start off with uh, Peterson coil, um, other, otherwise known as um, arc suppression or resonance grounding, a few different names here. Um, what you're doing is you, you have basically, you see here, you have a essentially a tappable inductance here. And the idea is, since, you have, since every system has this existing capacitance in it, and it's going to be um, creating, it's going to be basically having a current that's flowing through here on ground fault. What you're trying to do, and I mentioned already that capacitors can actually give, give a reactive power back to the system and inductors take that away. What you're trying to do is you're trying to basically balance the system so that therefore what your existing system's capacitance is canceled out by your what we call essentially a tunable or a tappable um, re uh, inductor reactor. So that's the idea of a Peterson coil. Um, like I said before, it matches the capacitance in a fault but 180 degrees out of phase. So if you look, I, I didn't put a picture of a signal, but you, I think most of us understand that if you have this 180 degrees out of phase, is just the exact opposite. So it's the exact opposite signal when you, when one signal meets the peak, the other signal meets the trough, and the, tr and the trough, and then you basically cancel each other out completely, or at least as best as you can. 
This is good because it reduces the chance of restrike. I talked before about an intermittent fault. Um, you basically have you, you're essentially um, you're essentially muting or just reducing the amount of capacitance in the system to a point where you don't really have much of a much of a, a buildup of a voltage when you when you're trying to fault that system. You, you're essentially canceling each other out, so that that effective capacitance has kind of been um, reduced drastically to the point where that first strike is there's not really going to be a chance for a restrike. The um, the reduced chance of an arc fault as well. You have a, you have a very little, little amount of, of current flowing because the goal is you really want to have almost zero flowing. You're canceling each other out on a, on a, on a, in a ground fault. So you're basically tuning it to the point where you have a very low chance uh, for arc faults as well because the amount of power that's being that's going through your system is very very low. So the, one of the some of the issues with piercing coils historically, um, it has to be tuned very well. I mean, it has to be tuned, you want it to be tuned to a point where it's, it's very low or effectively zero, um, your overall leakage current or your capacitive current. So, but what happens if you have a different load profiles or you, 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 there's, there's a, you know, different potential sources that you're going from, ATSs, et cetera. There's all kinds of different things that could happen in your system that could impact um your your capacitance your system one of the wires maybe opens or you have a damage somewhere on one of your feeders or all kinds of things can happen that changes the system's capacitance so you're going to need to be able to to operate that uh and be able to make changes to that so that's it's not really uh i don't, I don't think i've ever seen it used in industrial application um but we'll talk about the application later but basically there's some issues with it if you have a static system where there's much very little changing, uh, you definitely can use this. Uh, and we'll talk about kind of where, what the most common applications are. Um, it, it doesn't always work, depending on where you're at in the system, depending on where the fault's at in the system. You don't. It's not a foolproof solution essentially. So you do, you need some you need additional ground fault protection, whether it be a, a, a trip or some kind of other ground fault protection that you're going to have um to when, when those situations happen because you're, you're literally just tuning out the reactive portion of that fault if you have an active component it's not really taking care of that so ground fault neutralizers is, an, is another topic i'll be honest with you I've, I've read several papers on ground fault neutralizers there are some of them that define it as a piercing coil with uh with the basically auto tune inductance there's also other ones that just basically use it as a synonym for Peterson coil. I, I'm not really concerned with which, which one that is, but the point is, is that, it, you know, it's a part of that group and there is, there is a, an ability to auto tune the, the inductance. As you can kind of see on the right here, it's not a small amount of, uh, of monitoring equipment. Uh, it's good. It takes, you know, you have to look through all your different, um, things that can cause capacitance and me take measurements and kind of analyze and is, is, are there certain levels that have been breached, et cetera. Um, it's fairly, it's fairly uh, sophisticated equipment. Um, so what, 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 essentially what it does is it takes, it's the same exact idea as a Pearson coil, but it just auto tunes. It takes all the this in data it's getting from the system and it's making sure that's auto tuning the inductance so that it matches the capacitance. Um, these these uh, these systems typically need, they always need to be applied on all three, all three phases. So uh, when you have a, a traditional low re reactance ground, um, you um, when you have a traditional low reactance ground. It's a, it's it's not needed to be on all three phases, but it's much more similar to a to a resistance ground system. But with, the, with this type of system, you need to be applied on all three phases, and it can be fairly expensive. So there's some negatives about it. You know, one thing I forgot to mention, I apologize. Um, I meant to do this at the beginning and I got I, I did not do that. Uh, we're going to take a question and answer session at the end. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. There's like a question tab in on the side there where you can ask questions. We'll go ahead and look at through some of the questions. Um, I have uh, my counterpart, Stu, here. He's looking through all the questions. He may answer your question and not bring it up at the end, but he also 
uh, ones that aren't answered or, or um, depending on how many we have, uh, we'll definitely answer some at the end of, end of this. So please feel free to use that chat uh, in the question uh, tab to, to ask your questions and we'll, and we'll go ahead and answer them, whether it be uh, right now or at the end or, um, uh, or maybe even an email later. So uh, we just want to encourage questions because we want to make sure you guys get all your questions answered. So moving on to reactance grounding, and by reactance grounding, I mean essentially what I'm talking about is low reactance grounding. It's very similar to um, resistance grounding in, in the sense that you have you have uh, an impedance load between neutral and ground. Um, obviously, you have inductor or reactor um, instead of a resistor. But so that's that's the idea here. You have your inductor here. It's mat. It's uh, so what happens is you are you're because you have this re reactive load here, you're still suppressing the amount of current that flows. Um, once again, very similar to uh, resistors, except that you're just basically um, you're just basically impeding the reactive portion of the power. Um, so it is it does reduce the ground fault. Um, if as long as you have, we'll talk about it in a second. But as long as you have it cor correctly sized, it also reduces temporary over voltages. Uh, you do have the uh, the ability to the IEEE has something to say about. We'll talk about that in a minute. But one thing that's nice about uh, reactance grounding is that our limited temperature rise, because one of the differences I, I kind of I think I said it, but I'll just say it one more time. Reactive power doesn't do any work. If you if you remember the, 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 what work means, essentially it's creating energy, uh, um, non-electric, you know, basically energy in the in the form of, of heat, et cetera. Um, but it doesn't actually do work, so it, it can it can cancel each other out. So the, my point is, is that the temperature ratings and the the temperature that these units can get to are much lower than that of a resistor. Because the idea of a resistor is to just basically turn energy into heat or to suppress energy by turning it into heat so um, it enables longer lifetime i will say being a pro resistor guy uh i've seen resistors last for 30 plus years so i don't know if this is a huge advantage but um well it, it depends i'll we'll go into some more applications if you have a if you have a a, a large system with uh, a good amount of con continuous uh current uh this could be, be make a big difference so there are different but in terms of just standard resistance ground systems, uh, they last a long time as well. So I, I don't want to create the impression that they don't. So IEEE talks about um, what you should need to do for reactance grounding. Um, the minimum value should be at least 25% of the three phase fault current. Uh, essentially with the reactive ground, this is that over voltage situation I was talking about and how you need to size it correctly. Um, I've seen different scenarios where they talk about if you use 25%, it may be it may be a good idea to use some type of surge suppression just in case you do you get some over voltages. Uh, but I triply, as they say here, they, they prefer 60% of the three phase fault to current. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's for industrial applications, you have a very large amount of fault current. You don't see it that often. I mean, to be honest, we do definitely see it, um, and we'll talk about the applications, but don't see it very often comparatively, just because of that that high level of of fault current you need, the ground fault current you need, just to make sure that that over voltage condition doesn't happen. Um, so, and one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why we don't use unground systems anymore is because of those over voltage conditions, um, and you know, we, we don't, we would definitely want to make sure that we're not. Uh, using equipment that, that repeats the same issue. Uh, I mentioned uh, as well that the the uh, reactants will sustain the transient state and lead to over voltages uh, according to the formula uh, W E equals one half uh, inductance times current squared. And just some information for you. That's not really I guess from an over from a broader overview. It does you don't really need to know that, but it just I just thought it was interesting. That was that was the the relationship. So, like I mentioned, not typical industrial applications. Um, where I have seen it 
is definitely in, in generator applications. Uh, you definitely can use it. Uh, where you should, probably should use it. We're generated directly feeding single phase loads. Um, so, um, but they're more typical in higher voltage systems because of that. That uh, really at the higher voltage systems is where you may have a need for a higher fault current. Anyway, it's you know I think it's it was it was more common before, and I think it's been kind of overtaken by resistance grounding because there's just more positives to it. There's you can have a, a much lower ground fault current. But if you're in an application where you need higher ground fault current, it can definitely still be used. Um, one of those is the uh, the IEEE recommendation of impedance grounding of medium voltage generators. Essentially, uh, to be brief, IEEE recommends that you use impedance ground for medium voltage generators because um, you you can uh, um, you can basically get a a current on a ground fault that's higher than your bracing of your generator. Uh, we can go into the weeds and talk about positive sequence reactances versus zero sequence reactances. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, just basically that's the reason behind it. You can definitely get a higher current and you want to avoid that because that you can start getting mechanical failure, you start getting overheating, et cetera, if that happens on a generator. So you want to, you want to, you want to um, definitely avoid that. Uh, if your goal is to meet the recommendation, just to make sure you're under the bracing of the generator, uh, you can definitely do that with the reactor. Sometimes that it can definitely be, depending on the values of the of the, the voltage voltage and current values of the reactor, you can get um, lower lower cost for the reactor versus a, a, an equivalent resistor. Um, there's a lot. We'll talk about the resistance grounding and why you may want to use that and why it's used more than the reactors. But that is definitely a reason why you could use it. Um, can be used for larger transformers where desired fault current is higher, like I mentioned. Um, typically, what's, what drives a higher desire for fault current could be a neutral imbalance. Um, you know, if you have very large transformers, if you have a 1% or 2% uh, imbalance threshold, or if you, if, or, you know, you, you, that's, what you, that's, that's the kind of percentage you want to meet. Depending on how big your transformer is, that could be still a decent size of of current so you may need a larger uh, rated resistor and or reactor if it's really high then you probably it's more likely that the reactor will be less expensive well we can, we can get we'll get into a little more specifics on that moving on to resistance grounding i know i've talked about it a little bit already um just the resistor between neutral and ground i think i don't know maybe it, maybe it's just me i think a lot of us who who look at this stuff or interest in stuff kind of have used resistance ground. So if you haven't, I apologize. But basically, it's a resistor between neutral and ground. It's it's just an impedance ground, which limits the amount of current that can flow on a ground fault. Um, so what you need to do here, for terms of sizing, it's a little bit different because your only real requirement for sizing the neutral ground resistor was, I guess there's a couple, but the first one, the, the biggest one is you need to make sure the capacitive current is lower. So if you have a system's capacitance as it has an associated current with it, um, and I've been I've done I've done other uh, you know webinars and also uh, lunch and learns that you kind of go through how you can do stuff like this, how you can measure this, or how you can uh, calculate this. Uh, but as long as your resistance ground is actually higher in terms of current than than here, then you're you're okay in terms of over voltages. So it, let's just say in most low voltage applications, we're talking about two amps roughly here. I mean, less or less. Not it's usually fairly low on average. Uh, I'm not saying that's don't 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 trust that in your application. You should probably look into it. But most low voltage applications are, are low enough. You don't have to worry about it. Medium voltage applications are going to be higher. They could be upwards of 10 amps or more, depending on how big the system is. Um, so you, you need to make sure that this resistor is sized to be higher than this capacitive current here. And so, you know, when I say current here, all I'm saying is the let through current. So if this is impeding the amount of current that can flow, well, how much current is it letting th flow through? That's all I'm saying. So when we, when we tell you a 100 amp resistor, well, that's what we're talking about. You know, some people might be confused, like why is the resistor in terms of current? But that's all we're talking about, the amount of ground fault current that we allow through that resistor. Um, so because of the ability for it to, to match this capacitance at a low, much lower level, 
you can do uh, obviously lower ground fault levels, and that's a positive. I triple talks about um, the different things that are associated with resistance grounding and why you would use it. Essentially, it goes. It's we talk about uh, equipment protection, uh, personnel protection, especially for the higher impedance uh, of resistance ground uh, with arc flash, et cetera. But um, you know, there's also stray ground fault currents that you, you can reduce by means of a resistor. Uh, so and then we have the momentary voltage line dip. So there's all these things that IEEE 142 talks about in regards to why you would use resistance ground. Um, at the end of the day, it's basically equipment protection and relay coordination uh, along with, uh, depending, on, depending on the voltage and current value, uh, personnel protection as well. So if you have, let's say, a 400 amp resistor, okay, which is typical in industrial application at medium voltage, that compared to a solid grounded or even a reactive ground system could be a factor of 10 lower or, you know, even more than that potentially. Uh, so your ground fault current is much reduced and you're able to obviously survive a damage curve or even really engineer uh, the time that you relay trips to protect your equipment in a way that you don't have to worry about. In solid ground system, you're essentially, um, you're tripping as fast as you possibly can and hoping there's not, you're trying to eliminate as much damage as possible. You're just basically an instantaneous trip on high, high ground fault currents. Um, in, a, in a reactive ground system, it's similar. Once again, 60% is not much different. Um, so we're trying to trip for it fairly quickly. Uh, you get more time with the lower resistance ground system, 400 amps. Um, so you're able to not only equip, protect your equipment, keep it under those damage curves, but you're also able to coordinate properly. If you have 400 amps, it's, it's, it's still a lot of current. You're still going to have damage uh, per duration. But if you have an extra couple hundred milliseconds to trip, that could mean a difference between tripping your whole system offline because your main catches it first or trip, tripping, uh, coordinating correctly and tripping at your motor or whatever it is that has a, that has to trip, has a fault. So it's, a, it's an important distinction. That's why it's very popular at medium voltage when the, where there's uh, medium voltage loads. Um, dissipates energy is heat. Uh, this can be construed as a negative. I mean, yeah, you are, you are um, essentially uh, losing energy. Um, so uh, what I will say this, most of the time in your average application, you're tripping under a second or let's just say under two seconds to be safe. Um, and it's not a very long time to, to, to have energy. So you're not, not really worried about, in terms of energy loss, you're not necessarily worried about it. Now, one thing you could be worried about is if this thing had a large component of continuous operation. And if you're, you know, if you're dealing with imbalance, you're dealing with harmonics, you're dealing with a large amount of all, any of those things, you need to look at how much uh, energy you're actually losing as, as heat potentially. That could be more. But in your common application, we're talking, you know, uh, very low uh, harmonics uh, and very low imbalance to the point where you don't have a lot of heat loss there. Um, at higher voltages, and well, I mean by higher voltages, we're really talking above 15 kV. I mean, in, in, you know, usually over 20 kV. Um, but it also depends on the current. You can have, your resistors are going to get more expensive. So you, you essentially have to meet, for IEEE, for a low resistance ground system, you have to meet a certain temperature requirement for 10 seconds at 760 degrees C. And so that, that requirement doesn't change. So if you, you were to have a higher voltage and higher, um, higher current values, you're going to basically proportionally have to increase the amount of mass that the uh, the resistor has, so that you can uh, you can effectively mitigate that the heat to down to that required level. So it can get excessive the larger you go. So we're, we're, we'll talk about that more in detail in a minute. It cannot also cannot be used with line neutral loads for NEC. Here's the let's talk about that for a second. So you have a, a system here um, where you uh, you have your detection here. Typically, typically here it doesn't have to be here. A lot of times it's here. You have your CT here. You're looking for current flow here, uh, and you're going to trip your relay based off of here. Um, you have a line neutral load that you have installed. 
and it, let's say it shorts or something happens and you basically you're bypassing your resistor. It defeats the purpose of the resistor. The, the whole purpose of the resistor is to basically be the sole, besides the naturally occurring capacitance, the sole ground fault path uh, back to neutral so that when you complete the path, you have to go through your resistor. Therefore, you're, you're reducing the amount of current that's flowing. You're, you're energizing that CT. It's providing a signal back to that relay and tripping the system. That's how it works. If you bypass that, it's not going to work that way, and you're going to endanger potentially your equipment and your personnel. So how you get around that is you isolate basically these isolation transformers. And most of your app, this is a 40 volt example, but it works the same in in uh, in B voltage. You basically um, you basically would have isolation transformers here. You would solidly ground your your loads here. And um, you would the, the, your, your major loads are typically most of the time your line neutral loads are not major uh, loads that you want to keep operating. So you're going to continue to operate these loads, and then these can can trip if, they, if there's something wrong with them on a solid ground system. So that's kind of how that works. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and go to poll question number two. Now we're in the season of polls. Hopefully. Um, everybody will get to use the polls. We'll see how, what happens in a, in, a, in a couple months. All right, so let's go. I think everybody answered that question. Let's keep let's keep moving along. So let's talk about application of the of the types that we've talked about. So basically, we start with Peterson coils. Um, essentially, your main application is overhead power lines. Um, it's used it's used often, especially in like northern Europe, et cetera, for for overhead power lines. But it's a good fit um, because most faults are lined to ground and transient nature. You don't have a lot of variation in your capacitance. Um, it's fairly fixed. I mean, obviously, if you add overhead power lines, you, you, it would maybe change, but usually that's fairly consistent in terms of what you use there. Um, so, you know, the coil itself will reduce currents to levels of, of self-exchange. We've been through that already. Uh, and then we also talked about the sustained faults having to be, be tripped. But basically, uh, this is a good example. Uh, of where you would use Peterson coils because you don't have a lot of that switching that you have to worry about uh, or different load profiles, et cetera, um, at that voltage level. Now you may, that may change uh, obviously at different voltage levels, but um, that's where it's most commonly used. Uh, in terms of reactive grounding, it's not used traditionally in a lot of, in a lot of industrial applications. Uh, I've I've really usually only seen it in medium voltage generator applications. Um, essentially, uh, I mean, to, in my personal opinion, you basically use the the, the reactive ground uh, when you need to meet the IEEE requirement, and you are try, basically trying to reduce costs as as best as you can. Um, you're going to you're going to be below the bracing of your generator. So that's good, but you're not going to have any of the other uh, uh, the other benefits of, that a resistance ground system would have. Uh, so that's w basically the reason why you don't see that very often. But it doesn't mean it's not used. It doesn't mean you can't. You don't have to. Now, I, I already mentioned the kind of a um, a uncommon but perfect application. If you have the directly connected loads on your bus um, at mean voltage, then I mean, yeah, you're gonna you probably have to use that uh, as well. Um, something I've seen a lot more recently, I think it's been used before then, but just me personally, I've seen a lot more recently is, you know, when you're using at the utility level or basically when you have a very large transformer coming into an industrial uh, uh, application, uh, you're going to 
to have that that uh, load imbalance potentially. And I've seen that I've seen that happen. You know, I was, I've dealt with like four or five of these in the last couple of months, where they're looking at resistance ground, uh, because, but they 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 don't really realize that they have a large load imbalance. And it's hard to, and some, maybe some of you guys have, have dealt with this. It's not always easy to figure out your load imbalance. You can kind of are trying to guess it at some at some point during during your uh, your your design phases, and so it can be challenging. But I would say at those at those levels, you probably should look at both and see what's what makes more sense. Uh, once again, I think it's there are more benefits to resistance ground unless you're so high that um, the cost in or the you know the higher you go with current you know if you're a th you're, if you're a, lo a long a long ways from you know 400 amps if you're much higher than that you start to lose the benefits of lower distance ground and therefore reactive ground becomes a more economical solution resistance grounding it is used in the majority of industrial applications it's not used for transmission i mean it is used for utility for like generator stations etc um, but it's not typically used for transmission, uh, basically because there's no loads uh, typically there. And you don't really have, I mean, you're creating, a, at those voltage levels, you're creating a lot of heat. And it may not be easy to dissipate all that, all that heat. Um, and it could, it's going to be expensive as well. So, I mean, it's not really, you, the, your, your likelihood of a fault is not very high uh, because, you know, you don't have very many things that can, that can fail. You have basically transmission line, right? So um, it's at least lower, I should say. So usually it's not a good application for, for resistance grounding. But if there's, if there's mean voltage loads at mean voltage, uh, typically it's a, good, it's a good application for, um, for low resistance ground. So in terms of um, your voltage levels, I mean, really, we see in terms of what we see. Um, obviously, we don't. I, I'm guessing we don't see all the reactive uh, grounding uh, requests, but we don't typically see many applications where we were replaced by a reactor. Uh, but we, admittedly, we also mostly do at 15 kV or below. That's a, that's kind of what we mostly work with. Uh, so. But there's also a lot of papers that indicate that look, you know, below those levels, really you're going to be solid grounding, or even for an industrial application, more likely a resistance grounding. Um, above 15 kV, uh, you could, you tend to be used reactors more. Once again, I talked a little bit about how, um, you know, at those voltage levels, you're going to you said because of the the temperature loss that or the lack of temperature increases that you're going to experience, and then basically you have mechanical uh you know the higher current and voltage you get uh, because you're not creating a bunch of energy you're going to have more um more durability there um so it's good you're going to see more especially at 35 kv and above but really if it's above you know i would say technically 15 kv but really in our experience 20 kv with a higher ground fault current usually a thousand volts plus thousand amps excuse me plus that's when um uh, resistor resistors start costing a good amount of money uh, just to give you an example, um, I think we had uh, 22,000 amp, 22,000 volt resistor recently quoted um, at 400 amps. Uh, it had a, had a a a portion of co continuous current. It was roughly about twenty-five thousand dollars a piece. That's not a lot of money, but you know, compared to that, that's when resistors start to get more expensive. And so you could probably find a reactor maybe at that voltage level uh, for cheaper. Um, so you need to start looking at that when, when you start getting really high uh, in, in voltage and in current. So in conclusion, resistance ground is used most in industrial applications. I mean, I've, I've read some papers that basically say that reactance grounding is, is obsolete. I would not agree with that completely, just to be fair. Um, it, there, are, there is a place for it, but it is getting less popular, especially where I mentioned it, just because resistors make more sense. Um, once, but once again, if you have a situation where you are high voltage, high current, I would probably look at both and see what makes more sense for you. Reactance grounding, once again, more common in transmission applications or at least higher voltage applications. Uh, so that's that's basically what's what we, we're here to talk about today. Um, 
so you know once again i, I think we, we made the point you basically go you basically use resistance grounding uh until resistance grounding becomes a little, little bit too too much in terms of foot, footprint and or cost so in terms of uh the presentation uh, you can send all questions to me chris.smallpostlover.com uh, you will receive an email with a link to a video of this presentation uh, you will get a certificate of participation this is going to be good for most of the p uh, uh, continuing education requirements in, in your state i can't guarantee it. i don't i think i know most of the ones I, i'm familiar with that because i represent a certain you know i probably i probably uh I mean, I do lunch learns about in probably about 10 or 10 or 11 states, and that's so I know those would probably be fine. But I would say that the vast majority of you would have that certificate would be fine for your for your uh, for your local board, your state board. Uh, if you happen to find out that you need some more information or you need like uh, some more information printed on, on a certificate, just let us know. We can modify it or give you a new one. Uh, but I think most of you will will find it ad adequate. Uh, we can also send you a PDF version of the presentation if you would like. Um, so, uh, if you we're not going to send it to you automatically, but if you like one, go ahead and send us an email. And then, if you like, once again, if there's concerns with the the certificate participation, please let us know. All right, we're going to go ahead and move to the Q and A. Let's do. Do we have any questions? The first one came in from John Arnold, or the first one that we'll be addressing came in from John Arnold. Is there an easy way to calculate the continuous current rating of an NGR from its 10 second current rating? Well, so I'd say be careful. So, so there's a couple of different answers for this question. I've there's a couple of rules of thumb that aren't bad, uh, but I don't know if I would use them as a as a uh, blanket. For example, the, I've seen I've seen white paper before. I triply white paper that, that talked about how if you have a 10 second resistor let's say 400 amps uh roughly 10 percent of that would be the continuous capability of that resistor um well uh that may be that may be a, a decent rule of thumb the problem is that as a, as a manufacturer i do know that these aren't the, we don't design our 10 second resistors to have a continuous component i'm not saying it doesn't obviously it does it has mass but it's not tested that way. And so in order for me to feel comfortable with that, um, I would say you should probably ask your, your manufacturer of resistor, look, I have 40 amps of, of, of current continuous. Can I use this for an amp resistor? Or can you give me a solution that, can, that, can, that is rated for both? Because even if you, it can't handle 40 amps resistance, it's not rated for that. So it's up to you. I mean, it, basically, I would say I would I would be more cautious than that. So so rule of thumb I've seen before. Once again, 10%. But if you have a large, I would say to be safe, in my opinion, if you have more than 10 amps of continuous current, I would say ask your resistor manufacturer to see if they can design something for you, or if their existing design meets that spec. Uh, the second question that we'll be taking in the open forum part is um, regarding the resistor grounding, what is the significance of the time rating? I often see NGRs referred to as X amps for Y seconds and Z amps continuously. Could you help us understand these values better? I'm sorry. I was, uh, you're going to need to repeat the first part of that again. Sorry, Stu. Go ahead. Explain the significance of a 10 second rating or a continuous rating or other possible time ratings on resistance. Okay. Um, I mean, so basically it's just the, it, it's based on the design of the resistor. So most of the time you're looking to trip the resistor and um, get below your damage curves and basically, or at least as best you can and try to limit the damage to the system and, and the exposure to the system. That's usually the goal. So therefore it's a very short duration. That's when you would typically use a 10 second resistor. Um, that's, a, that's like basically an industry standard. You don't typically have less than that, even though a lot of people wouldn't use it that, that for that long. Um, but that's essentially what that means is your resistor is gonna last 10 seconds at that current level 
um, where it would meet 760 degrees C requirements. Therefore, if it goes longer than that, if you say your relay fails, it's going to start increasing temperature. Eventually, it would fail. So that's the idea. If you have a 60 second resistor, obviously it's it's going to last for 60 seconds. But sometimes you have transient faults that um, that you want to basically ride through. Like you, you say you have a you know let's say a 10 cycle or maybe 20, whatever it's going to be. However, how, you know what you would consider a transient fault. And you want to be able to ride through. You get, you get it enough that you, it's not going to it's not going to damage your system based off a certain current level that you that, that you pick with the resistor, but you want to be able to ride through it so you're not tripping all the time. Um, and in that situation, it's usually more of an application for a longer duration uh, resistor. Um, and then continuous, obviously, those are usually used more so for either like an MSHA rating where they uh, I would say they have a conservative uh, requirement there or like a high resistance ground system where you, you literally are continually operating the resistor on purpose because you're operating with the ground fault. So those are the major differences in terms of uh, your timing. And that is the end of our question and answer session. All right, so um, yes, I'm guessing Stu probably already answered some of your questions. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we missed any, we'll definitely get to you. Uh, we'll definitely get to you uh, after this via email. Like I said, if you have any questions moving forward, please email uh, me and uh, we'll definitely take care of your, your question uh, via email or give us a call as well. So we're around. We appreciate your guys' time. Thanks a lot. And uh, hopefully we'll look forward to the, the next, uh, um, I can't remember the title, but it's basically uh, HRG in the in the world of data centers. So basically we have uh, how, how to best implement and how uh, HRG, high resistance ground works with data centers. So that'll be next month. If you guys are interested, please sign up. And thanks again, guys, for your time.